We have Ryan Corcoran uh, from our own faculty here. Um, he's been an outstanding clinical fellow and now a research uh, fellow with, with uh, Jeff Engelman and soon to inherit a uh, senior position at one of the major institutions. We hope he stays in Boston. Um, but Ryan is going to speak uh, first to this morning on, on the uh, molecular biology of uh, RAF-driven tumors. All right, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today. I want to thank uh, Bruce and the STO for uh, inviting me here uh, to talk to you all. Um, and I'll be talking to you today about uh, strategies to overcome resistance in BRAF and KRAS mutant cancers. So BRAF and KRAS uh, be, uh, are members of the MAP kinase signaling pathway, which is frequently mutated in human cancers. Uh, specifically, RAS proteins, most commonly, or RAS genes, most commonly KRAS, are mutated in 20% of all cancers, making it the most common oncogenic mutation in all of human cancer. Additionally, BRAF mutations are found in 7% of human cancers, and so collectively, these mutations uh, are found uh, in the tumors of a large percentage of patients, making uh, the MAP kinase pathway an important uh, target. Consequently, uh, inhibitors of MAP kinase signaling have been under uh, active clinical development, including selected BRAF inhibitors and selective MEK inhibitors. However, the clinical efficacy of these agents has been limited by, the, by uh, resistance signals which bypass the effects of these inhibitors. And the overall hypothesis of our work is that by identifying and targeting these resistance pathways in combination with either BRAF or MEK inhibitors, we can overcome resistance and improve clinical response. So uh, to accomplish this goal, we, uh, our work has taken a, a highly translational approach uh, using laboratory models of genetically defined cancers, uh, we focus on developing promising therapeutic strategies to, for evaluation in clinical trials with, pa uh, with patients with these same genetically defined cancers. At the same time, we utilize clinical specimens, such as patient tumor biopsies, often uh, obtained through the course of these very clinical trials, uh, to uh, carry out important correlative studies that can inform future laboratory investigation. And in this way, our work uh, tries to bridge the gap between the laboratory and the clinic uh, to advance patient care. So I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, two uh, projects today. Uh, the first involves novel BRAF inhibitor-based combination approaches for BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, and the second involves novel uh, MEK inhibitor-based combination approaches for KRAS mutant cancers. So BRAF mutations are found in about 10 to 15 percent of colorectal cancer, and they're associated with older age, female gender, and right side or proximal colonic tumors. So BRAF mutations in colorectal cancer also predict poor outcome, leading to a, a roughly two-fold increase in mortality rev, uh, relative to patients with wild-type uh, BRAF. So uh, consequently, effective therapies for this lethal and aggressive subtype of colorectal cancer are gravely needed. Now, about half of melanomas also harbor mutations in BRAF. And uh, BRAF inhibitors, such as vemurafenib, have led to dramatic results, 60 to 80 percent response rates uh, in BRAF mutant melanomas, as seen here in one of the initial studies conducted by Keith Flaherty. On this waterfall plot, each, each bar represents the change in cumulative tumor diameter uh, for each patient uh, following treatment. And this red line here, representing a decrease in tumor size of 30 percent, is the cutoff that we use to call a partial response. Now, based on the Tremendous activity uh, uh, that vemurafenib dem demonstrated in this study and in future studies, um, the, it led to its FDA approval uh, last year in BRAF mutant melanoma. However, when patients with colorectal cancer harboring the exact same BRAF mutation are treated with the exact same BRAF inhibitor, only a 5% response rate is observed. So clearly, there's a fundamental difference between BRAF mutant colorectal cancer and BRAF mutant melanoma. And the focus of our work is to identify the key resistance signals uh, that mediate BRAF inhibitor resistance in colorectal cancer. So to attempt to answer this question, we began by evaluating ce uh, cell line models of, of BRAF mutant colorectal cancer and BRAF mutant melanoma. And consistent with our clinical findings, we found that uh, BRAF mutant colorectal cancer cell lines were far less sensitive to BRAF inhibition than BRAF mutant melanoma. In BRAF mutant melanoma, vemurafenib led to an overall decrease in tumor cell number relative to starting cell number over the 72-hour treatment period. 
whereas in BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, we still observed an overall increase in uh, tumor cell number over the uh, treatment period, albeit at a slower rate than vehicle-treated control. So to begin to understand uh, what underlies this phenomenon, we evaluated the effects of um, vemurafenib on MAP kinase signaling in melanoma and in colorectal cancer, and very early on identified a very important difference. In BRAF mutant melanoma, vemurafenib shuts off phosphoric and keeps phosphoric off for the entire 48-hour treatment period. However, in BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, inhibition of phosphoric by vemurafenib is transient, and levels of phosphoric recover rapidly uh, over time. Now, if you quantify this, you find that vemurafenib leads to near 100% inhibition of uh, phosphoric uh, for the entire 48-hour uh, period, whereas in BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, by 48 hours, you have recovery of roughly 25 to 50% of the initial phosphoric levels. Now, because near complete suppression of phosphoric is thought to be required for clinical response to BRAF inhibitors, this represents a major problem and is very likely what underlies the insensitivity of BRAF mutant colorectal cancers to these agents. So to begin to understand what drives uh, this, this resistance, we took two BRAF mutant colorectal cancer cell lines that, unlike most, are actually sensitive to MAP kinase pathways and inhibitors, and uh, made them resistant to the MEK inhibitor AZD6244. As it turns out, these resistant clones were also highly resistant to BRAF inhibitors. And when these clones were analyzed, uh, we found that resistance was caused by marked amplification of the mutant BRAF allele indicated uh, uh, by this red probe, going from roughly three copies uh, per cell in parental cells to as many as 20 copies per cell in, in, uh, in, in resistant cell lines. Interestingly, when we looked at biopsies, uh, tumor biopsies taken from BRAF mutant colorectal cancer patients who were treatment naive, we found evidence of pre-existing BRAF amplification in roughly 10% of patients, suggesting that this mechanism could contribute to, uh, to resistance uh, in the clinic. Now, BRAF amplification led to such heightened activation of MEK and ERK uh, that the ability of single-agent MEK inhibitor and single-agent BRAF inhibitor to inhibit phospho-ERK was severely abrogated. However, even though these clones were resistant to single agent, to MEK inhibitor alone or to BRAF inhibitor alone, the combination of a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor was able to effectively suppress phospho-ERK and was able to restore sensitivity in these resistant clones to, lev to levels similar to that seen in the parental cell lines with each agent alone. But moreover, we found that the combination of a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor also suppressed phospho-ERK more effectively in parental cell lines and led to increased sensitivity, suggesting that combined BRAF and MEK inhibition could be a more effective uh, treatment in all BRAF mutant colorectal cancers. So based on these data, we uh, developed a clinical trial combining the BRAF inhibitor dabrafenib with a MEK inhibitor trametinib in BRAF mutant colorectal cancer patients. And while this trial has almost reached its uh, enrollment goal of 40 patients, we presented the interim uh, results of the first 26 patients on this trial at the ASCO annual meeting in June. And what we found is that we observed a 12% response rate with an additional 50% of patients exhibiting stable disease and 15% of patients achieving a minor response. However, what was most interesting is that the patients who did, did well on this trial had very uh, dramatic responses. So these are uh, CT scans from three individual patients taken before treatment and after treatment with the BRAF and MEK inhibitor combination. And these red arrows indicate the large, largest tumor lesions in the pretreatment scans. And as you can see, that following uh, treatment with the BRAF MEK inhibitor combination, very dramatic uh, tumor uh, reductions were seen in all of these patients, and in some cases, near total uh, reductions. And these are uh, more pronounced uh, tumor responses than, than were observed with BRAF inhibitor alone. Specifically, this patient has gone on to achieve a complete response or a 100% reduction in their tumor size and has, uh, she has completed uh, over 10 months of study and remains on trial uh, today without evidence of tumor recurrence. Similarly, we found that there was a, a, a sizable population of patients who, uh, who achieved prolonged disease control uh, of six months or more uh, on this therapy. And I'll point out that this is an interim analysis. The patients indicated as arrows uh, remain on, uh, remained on study at the time of this analysis, and many of these patients remain uh, on study today. So clearly, there appears to be a population of patients 
who do very well with, uh, the com with, uh, with combined BRAF and MEK inhibition. And currently, molecular analysis of the pretreatment tumor biopsies of all patients enrolled in this trial are currently underway to identify biomarkers that can potentially predict which patients are most likely to benefit. Still, the efficacy of this therapy does not approach the effectiveness uh, uh, observed in BRAF mutant melanoma. And clearly, a, a, a substantial population of patients still do not benefit from this treatment. So we took this information back to the lab and tried to uh, more clearly understand what is driving this MAP kinase pathway reactivation in these cancers. And what we did was to look upstream of MEK to see what might be reactivating the pathway. And we found that CRAF, which is another RAF kinase uh, family member, uh, became activated following vemurafenib treatment in BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, but not in BRAF mutant melanoma. And its reactivation correlated with the recovery of phospho-ERK. Now, it's been previously shown that CRAF is able to bypass the effects of BRAF inhibitors uh, and lead to resistance. Uh, looking at, at upstream of CRAF, we evaluated the effects of vemurafenib treatment on RAS activity, since RAS is the uh, primary activator of CRAF. And what we found is that following vemurafenib treatment, levels of active GTP round RAS were far higher in BRAF mutant colorectal cancers than in BRAF mutant melanomas. To identify what might be activating RAS, we looked again upstream at receptor tyrosine kinases, or RTKs, which are the canonical activators of RAS. And initially, we took a global approach uh, using phospho-RTK arrays of, uh, of BRAF mutant colorectal cancers and BRAF mutant melanomas, both before and after vemurafenib treatment. Now, on these arrays, each pair of dots represents uh, a phosphorylated active form of a different RTK. And immediately, what, what's, uh, what's easily recognizable is that BRAF mutant melanomas are largely devoid of phospho-RTK activity, whereas in BRAF mutant colorectal cancers, elevated levels of several uh, uh, phosphorylated RTKs are observed, although we did not observe an increase in uh, RTK phosphorylation following vemurafenib treatment. Now, by Western blot, we confirmed that the phosphorylated and total levels of several, several RTKs were also elevated in BRAF mutant colorectal cancer relative to BRAF mutant melanoma. However, it's worth noting that only EGFR showed consistent elevation of both the phosphorylated and total forms in all BRAF mutant colorectal cancer cell lines relative to BRAF mutant melanoma. So to determine if a single RTK might be the predominant uh, driver of, of MAP kinase pathway reactivation in these cancers, we treated these cells with a combination of vemurafenib and different agents that uh, inhibited uh, the specific RTKs that we found to be elevated in the previous experiment. What we found that consistent with our prior results, vemurafenib alone after 24 hours led to incomplete suppression of phospho work. However, when vemurafenib was used in combination with agents that inhibit EGFR, but not in combination with agents that inhibit other RTKs, we observed complete suppression of phospho work. This suggests that EGFR is the primary driver of MAP kinase pathway reactivation, which we were able to confirm by siRNA-mediated SIRNA knockdown of EGFR. Similarly, um, we found that the induction of RAS activity following vemurafenib treatment could be blocked by the addition of an EGFR inhibitor, again, suggesting that EGFR is responsible for activating RAS and leading to, uh, to uh, MAP kinase pathway reactivation through CRAF. Consistent with this model, uh, when cells were treated with the combination of a BRAF and an EGFR inhibitor, uh, complete suppression of phospho ERK was seen throughout the entire 48-hour period. <clears throat> and, uh, and consistent with these findings, we found that the combination of a BRAF and an EGFR inhibitor led to <clears throat> significantly improved efficacy in all four of these BRAF mutant colorectal cancer models. So our model is as follows. In BRAF mutant colorectal cancers, at baseline, <coughs> Phosphoric activity is driven primarily by mutant BRAF. And EGFR is active, but is, is unable to activate RAS due to the presence of ERK-dependent negative feedback signals, of which there are several well-defined members. Early after vemurafenib treatment, mutant BRAF is effectively suppressed, leading to a transient reduction in phospho-ERK, but EGFR is still unable to activate RAS due to, the pers due to persistent levels of these ERK-dependent negative feedback signals. However, later in treatment, as these negative feedback signals decay, EGFR can now engage and activate RAS, leading to reactivation of the MAP kinase pathway. However, if a BRAF inhibitor is used in combination with an EGFR inhibitor, this EGFR-dependent MAP kinase pathway reactivation is blocked, 
and ERK remains suppressed. So it's, it's important to note that Rene Bernard's group um, published a study with very similar findings around the same time as our paper. And while there are some subtle differences in the mechanisms of our model, the overall conclusion of both of our studies is that uh, the combination of a BRAF and an EGFR inhibitor is a promising uh, potential therapy for BRAF mutant colorectal cancer patients. And so to, to evaluate combined BRAF and, and EGFR inhibition in uh, BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, we evaluated two uh, independent BRAF mutant colorectal cancer xenografts. And what we found was that vemurafenib alone in red or the EGFR inhibitor allotinib alone in green had minimal, if any, effect on tumor growth relative to vehicle-treated control. However, the combination of, a BRAF of the BRAF inhibitor and EGFR inhibitor led to uh, dramatic tumor reductions in each model. And consistent with our model, we also found that only in the presence of a BRAF and an EGFR inhibitor did we see inhibition of phospho-ERK in these tumors and inhibition of cell proliferation. So to see if our uh, laboratory findings mirrored findings in the clinic, we evaluated tumor biopsies from patients with BRAF mutant colorectal cancer and BRAF mutant melanoma uh, to evaluate uh, levels of phospho-EGFR. And what we found is that roughly 60% of BRAF mutant colorectal cancers express very high levels of phospho-EGFR, where the vast majority of BRAF mutant melanomas uh, 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 had very low levels of phospho-EGFR. So this suggests that the baseline elevated levels of phospho-EGFR found in BRAF mutant colorectal cancers may make these cancers more prone to EGFR-mediated resistance. At the same time, however, not all BRAF mutant colorectal cancers express high levels of phospho-EGFR, so it's possible that phospho-EGFR levels may also be an important biomarker of EGFR-dependent resistance and may predict populations that might respond differently to different targeted therapies. So to summarize this part of the talk, phospho-ERK inhibition via amurafenib is transient in BRAF mutant colorectal cancers. EGFR drives phospho-ERK reaccumulation through RAS activation and CRAF induction. Combined BRAF and EGFR inhibition sustains phosphoric suppression and leads to tumor regressions in uh, in vivo models of BRAF mutant colorectal cancers. And finally, human BRAF mutant colorectal cancers have higher levels of phospho-EGFR than BRAF mutant melanomas, suggesting that this may be the reason that colorectal cancers are more prone to EGFR-mediated resistance. This also raises the possibility that baseline phospho-EGFR levels could be a biomarker that might predict uh, which patients are more uh, likely to respond to a given therapy. So where do we go from here? Uh, specifically, how do we apply these two different uh, potential therapies, combined BRAF and MEK inhibition, or combined BRAF and EGFR inhibition in the clinic? Is one always going to be better? Are there different populations of patients that might respond better to one therapy and not the other? And do we need biomarkers to differentiate these patients? So to begin to answer this question, uh, we assessed the levels of phospho-EGFR in a small number of patients on our BRAF and MEK inhibitor combination trial. And while analysis of, of more patients is needed, uh, what we found in this small subset was a striking correlation between phospho-EGFR levels and clinical benefit. Specifically, those patients with the lowest levels of phospho-EGFR had, uh, had the best clinical outcomes whereas patients with the highest levels of phospho-EGFR progress rapidly through treatment. So this suggests that one possibility would be to stratify BRAF mutant colorectal cancer patients based on their phospho-EGFR status, where patients with low phospho-EGFR might be treated best with BRAF and MEK inhibitor combination, whereas patients with high EGFR might be best treated with a BRAF and EGFR inhibition. Now, an alternative approach might be to try and create a one-size-fits-all strategy. So while BRAF and EGFR inhibition might be very effective in those tumors uh, where, EG, where resistance is driven by EGFR, this combination is unlikely to be effective where resistance is driven by other receptor tyrosine kinases or by other downstream resistance mechanisms such as BRAF amplification, which I discussed earlier. But if we potentially could add a MEK inhibitor to this combination, we could now block both EGFR-dependent resistance and resistance due to these other mechanisms. And so we're attempting to answer this question in the clinic with a clinical trial that's scheduled to open later this year. And in this trial, we'll be randomizing BRAF mutant colorectal cancer patients to two treatment arms. The first arm will evaluate BRAF and EGFR inhibition, which again, we might be expected, which might be expected to only be effect effective in patients with EGFR-driven resistance. And in the second arm, patients will receive the combination of EGFR, BRAF, and a MEK inhibitor. 
And the hope is that this combination will be effective in a broader range of patients with different resistance mechanisms. Now, of course, the key question is whether this triple combination will be tolerated in patients. However, because we found that the combination of a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor was tolerated as well as a BRAF inhibitor alone, we're hopeful that if this combination is tolerable, that this combination will be tolerable as well. Now, on this study, we will be obtaining pretreatment, on-treatment, and post-progression biopsies for key correlative studies. Specifically, <clears throat> pretreatment biopsies from all patients will be analyzed to assess potential biomarkers uh, that could predict uh, sensitivity or resistance. Paired pretreatment and on-treatment day 15 biopsies will be used to assess important pharmacodynamic questions, such as, is there effective inhibition of phospho-ERK, and do we see activation or inhibition of potential resistance pathways? And finally, in those patients who have an initial response to treatment, we will be uh, collecting post-progression biopsies, which we will analyze to uh, identify potential mechanisms of acquired resistance. And through these and future studies, we hope, to, uh, to, uh, we hope that this work will lead to improved uh, treatments for patients with this highly aggressive and lethal subset of colorectal cancer. So I'm going to shift gears now and move to the second part of my talk, which uh, will involve novel MEK inhibitor-based combination approaches for KRAS mutant cancers. Now, as I mentioned, uh, KRAS mutations are the most common oncogenic mutation in human cancer. However, unfortunately, efforts to target uh, KRAS directly thus far have been unsuccessful. So a considerable amount of effort has been focused on, on identifying and inhibiting downstream effector pathways in KRAS to try and, uh, 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 to try and gain efficacy. Now, <clears throat> a large-scale cell line screen conducted at the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Molecular Therapeutics identified MEK inhibitors as the single most effective agents in KRAS mutant cancers. However, when KRAS mutant cancers are treated in vivo with a MEK inhibitor alone, we do not observe tumor regressions. Rather, we find that the tumor continues to grow despite the presence of a MEK inhibitor, although, albeit at a slower rate than in vehicle-treated uh, control. And this is really consistent with our clinical experience thus far with single-agent MEK inhibitors in KRAS mutant cancers, where we've often observed stable disease, but rarely observed true objective responses, rarely if ever uh, observe uh, true objective responses. And one possible explanation for this is that while MEK inhibitors very effectively inhibit cell proliferation in most KRAS mutant cancers, they rarely induce a cell death response. And that can be seen here. Uh, measuring the apoptotic response to MEK inhibitor alone in a panel of 30 KRAS mutant cancer cell lines from different tissue types. However, work by Jeff Engelman and others has shown that when you combine MEK inhibitors with other agents, specifically PI3 kinase inhibitors, you can generate uh, improved apoptotic responses in some KRAS mutant cancers, and that this can lead to robust tumor regressions in vivo in KRAS mutant cancer models, such as this genetically engineered model of KRAS mutant lung cancer. However, two very important questions remain. First, is it possible to, to obtain or achieve a high-level continuous inhibition of these two critical pathways, PI3 kinase and MEK, in patients without uh, uh, encountering unacceptable toxicity? And second, even if we are, uh, our data suggests that a large subset of KRAS mutant cancers may not actually be sensitive to this combination. Indeed, about half of the cell lines in this panel did not show a marked uh, cell death response to this combination. So while this work shows the promise of, of, uh, of combination therapies, uh, it's clear that we need to identify uh, additional more effective uh, uh, targeted therapy combinations for, pay, uh, for uh, tumors harboring KRAS mutations. So to accomplish this, we developed a pooled shRNA drug screen approach to identify gene targets which, when inhibited, cooperate with MEK inhibitors to kill KRAS mutant cancer cells. And now while this screen can be modified to incorporate any, tar any uh, uh, targeted agent in the future, our initial studies have used MEK inhibitors uh, for two reasons. One is based on the large-scale screening data I showed you, MEK inhibitors have been found to be the most effective agents um, uh, to date in KRAS mutant cancers. But second, MEK inhibitors in the clinic have actually led to stable disease in some patients. And so, they, uh, so MEK inhibitors appear to be a promising backbone for potential targeted therapy combinations. Now in this screen, a uh, pooled shRNA library of 5,000 shRNAs targeting 1,200 uh, druggable genes, including kinases and important regulators of cell survival and proliferation. Um, this library is infected into target cells. And these target cells are split into three populations. 
The first population is immediately frozen to represent the initial population. And the other two populations are cultured for one week in the presence or absence of a MEK inhibitor. And following this treatment period, genomic DNA is isolated. And the abundance of each shRNA sequence in the genomic DNA of cells is uh, quantitated by next generation sequencing approaches. So through this approach, we were able to specifically identify shRNAs that drop out in the MEK inhibitor treated sample relative to the vehicle treated sample, uh, such as this blue hairpin here. At the same time, we're able to filter out shRNAs that are universally toxic to cells, such as the pink hairpin, which may drop out both in vehicle treated and MEK inhibitor treated samples. So in this way, we can ideally identify genes that specifically cooperate with MEK inhibitors in KRAS mutant cancer cells. We performed the screen initially <clears throat> with two KRAS mutant cancer cell lines with varying sensitivity to PI3 kinase and MEK inhibition. And we did this to try and identify combination strategies that had efficacy that was, that was independent of sensitivity to PI3 kinase and MEK inhibition. So this is the example of uh, our screen data for one of the cell lines used. And the way we uh, selected our hits was by identifying hairpins uh, whose abundance decreased in the MEK inhibitor treated sample relative to the initial population shown on this axis, but also hairpins that decreased in abundance in the MEK inhibitor treated sample relative to the vehicle treated control to ensure that there was cooperativity with the MEK inhibitor. Now we identified multiple hits in each cell line, but we focused specifically on the 17 hits that were common to each cell line. And one of these hits, BCL2L1, which encodes the anti-apoptotic protein BCLXL, emerged as the most promising hit in our validation studies. As you can see, knockdown of BCLXL leads to dramatic reduction in cell viability in the presence of MEK inhibitor in both of these cell lines, and that's quantitated here. But because we're interested in, in developing therapeutic strategies for patients, we wanted to see if pharmacologic inhibition of BCLXL in combination with MEK uh, was effective in these cancers. So we use this molecule, Abbott 263 or Navitoclax, which is an, belongs to a class of inhibitors called BH3 mimetics. Now, BH3 mimetics binds to the inhibitory binding groove of anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins such as BCLXL, BCL2, and BCLW. And by binding to this, to this inhibitory groove, it prevents the ability of the anti-apoptotic protein to bind and inhibit pro-apoptotic proteins. Of note, this molecule does not inhibit some anti-apoptotic BCL2 members, such as MCL1 or BCL2A1. Now, when Abbott 263 was given in combination with a MEK inhibitor, we found a significant uh, uh, increase in efficacy, leading to an overall reduction in tumor cell number relative to starting cell number. This is indicative not just of an inhibition of cell growth, but also to uh, with an induction of cell death. And consistent with those findings, we found that the combination of Abbott 263 and a MEK inhibitor led to significantly greater induction of apoptosis uh, relative to each agent alone. And as a result, we decided to, tr we, we began to investigate the mechanism by which this pharmacologic combination leads to induction of cell death in KRAS mutant cancers. So apoptosis in cancer cells is regulated by a delicate balance between pro-apoptotic proteins and anti-apoptotic proteins that bind to and inhibit pro-apoptotic proteins. So when this balance favors the anti-apoptotic protein, the cell survives. But if the balance tips in favor of the, pro the pro-apoptotic signals, the cell undergoes apoptosis and dies. What we found was that consistent with prior studies, when these cells were treated with a MEK inhibitor, we saw a dramatic induction of the pro-apoptotic protein BIM. However, our immunoprecipitation experiments showed that in the presence of MEK inhibitor alone, that increased level of BIM was bound by a proportionally increased amount of BCLXL, suggesting that, that those increased levels of BIM were not free to promote apoptosis. However, the addition of Abbott 263 abrogated this inhibitory uh, uh, interaction between BCLXL and BIM, thus freeing BIM to uh, promote uh, cell death. And so our model for this is as follows. Uh, in KRAS mutant cancers, uh, BIM levels are inhibited by MAP, MAP kinase pathway signaling, and, and existing levels of BIM are bound and inhibited by BCLXL. Now, in the presence of a MEK inhibitor alone, BIM levels are markedly increased, but those levels are bound up and inhibited by BCLXL. However, when Abbott 263 is given and abrogates this inhibitory binding uh, uh, interaction, this now increased level of BIM is free to promote uh, cell death. 
So even though MAC inhibitors alone don't lead to cell death in KRAS mutant cancers, it's possible that they prime these cancers for cell death by leading to increased levels of BIM and uh, making them prone to a secondary insult such as Abbott 263, which blocks that inhibitory binding, allowing BIM to promote cell death. <clears throat> and uh, accordingly, we found that this combination was very effective at promoting apoptosis in, a panel, in the same panel of 30 K Rasputin cell lines from three different tumor types. Although it is worth noting that roughly one quarter of cells did not uh, 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 exhibit a notable apoptotic response to this combination. Still, however, this, these data suggest that this combination has the potential to have broad efficacy in K Rasputin cancers of several uh, tissue types. So, to evaluate uh, the potential for this uh, therapy in KRAS mutant cancers, we evaluated its effects in three independent KRAS mutant xenograft models. And as we've observed before, treatment with a MEK inhibitor alone in red led to a largely cytostatic effect, and the, and, uh, the tumor still increased in size over time. Abbott 263 on its own had relatively little effect relative to vehicle treated control, but the combination of Abbott 263 and a MEK inhibitor led to dramatic tumor regressions. In, uh, in all three models. In treated tumors, we found that consistent with our in vitro uh, models that MEK inhibitor alone led to, uh, led to robust inhibition of phospho-ERK and robust uh, inhibition of cell proliferation, but failed to induce a significant cell death response uh, shown here by cleave caspase 3 staining. However, when Abbott 263 is given in combination with a MEK inhibitor, uh, a robust uh, cell death response is observed, which likely accounts for the dramatic tumor regressions seen in our in vivo models. And so, it's so, so our model is that Abbott 263 converts the largely cytostatic response of a MEK inhibitor into a uh, cell death response, uh, leading to improved efficacy. Now, while uh, uh, xenograft models are certainly uh, very helpful, they do have their limitations. And so we also evaluated the efficacy of this combination in a genetically engineered mouse model of KRAS mutant uh, lung cancer in collaboration with Kwok Wong. Now these mice have a mutant KRAS allele that can be conditionally activated by the removal of a stop element flanked by lock sequence, lock uh, uh, sites. So when these mice are given inhaled adenoviral Cree recombinase, they develop de novo lung tumors with intact tumor microenvironments. And these tumors can be, uh, can be monitored throughout treatment by MRI scans. And to orient you, this is a cross-section uh, through the thorax of a mouse. This is the, mouse, the sternum and the spine. And this large uh, structure in the center of the chest is the heart. On either side is the lung. And as you can see in these, mice, in these images from mice pretreatment, the lungs are riddled with dense uh, tumor nodules. However, after just one week of treatment with Abbott 263 and a MEK inhibitor, we see dramatic tumor reductions, uh, reductions in tumor size. And uh, these reductions were significantly greater than seen uh, with each agent alone. And many of these tumor regressions were durable uh, for, uh, for uh, seven weeks or more. So overall, uh, this uh, is some very promising uh, preclinical data for this combination. In fact, true tumor regressions in KRAS mutant cancer models in vivo are very hard to achieve. And collectively, this represents uh, some of the most uh, uh, encouraging uh, preclinical data that we've seen with any targeted therapy regimen to date in KRAS mutant cancers. I should also say that we saw similar levels of tumor reductions in another uh, genetically engineered model that also, uh, in addition to KRAS, had concomitant loss of the mutant, uh, of um, the P53 tumor suppressor gene. So to summarize, uh, we developed a screen to rapidly identify targets uh, for combination therapy with MEK inhibitors in KRAS mutant cancers. BCLXL, an anti-apoptotic uh, gene, scored as a top hit. And a BCLXL inhibitor, Abbott 263, in combination with a MEK inhibitor, was broadly effective in, in vitro in KRAS mutant cancer models from multiple tissue types. We found that this combination seemed to work because Abbott 263 blocked the inhibitory association between BCLXL and the proapoptotic protein BIM that is normally induced by MAP kinase pathway inhibition. And the combination of Abbott 263 and a MEK inhibitor leads to marked tumor regressions in multiple in vivo uh, models of KRAS mutant cancers. So uh, as far as where we plan to go uh, with this project, uh, we are currently developing a, uh, a, a clinical trial uh, through CTEP to evaluate the combination of, of uh, Abbott 263 and a MEK inhibitor in patients with KRAS mutant cancers. 
Now, this trial will have two parts. The first part will be a dose escalation safety study in which patients with KRAS mutant cancers will receive increasing doses of ABA263 and, uh, and a MEK inhibitor to identify the maximum tolerated dose of each drug when given in combination. Once this dose is established, part two of the study will involve expansion cohorts of KRAS mutant cancer patients with specific uh, tumor types, such as pancreatic cancer, in which 90% of patients roughly have KRAS mutations, colorectal cancer, where about 40% have KRAS mutations, and lung cancer, where about 30% have KRAS mutations. In addition, we'll have a fourth cohort uh, that will involve uh, patients with KRAS mutations of all other tumor types. Um, as with our other uh, protocols, we plan to uh, obtain uh, key uh, pretreatment, on-treatment, and post-progression biopsies for critical correlative science studies. And in particular, uh, since we don't expect every patient with a KRAS mutant cancer to respond to this therapy, one of our major initial focuses will be on identifying potential biomarkers of sensitivity or resistance to this therapy. And to, to aid us in this process, we've also uh, conducted, uh, conducted and, and will plan to continue to conduct parallel laboratory investigations to identify potential markers of sensitivity. Now, as you remember from our 30, uh, 30 cell line panel of KRAS mutant cancer cell lines, not every uh, cancer was sensitive to this combination. So we analyzed the microarray gene expression profiles of these cell lines to identify <clears throat> uh, genes whose expression correlated most closely with sensitivity to this combination. And gene set enrichment analysis of, this, uh, of these genes showed that um, that these genes were highly enriched for genes involved in epithelial differentiation or epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT. In fact, over 25% of the genes uh, were, were related uh, to, uh, to these processes. So arrows in blue represent uh, markers that are uh, associated with epithelial differentiation, including e cadherin And you can see that these are more highly expressed in those cancers that are sensitive to the combination. Conversely, those arrows in red represent markers that are more closely related to mesenchymal differentiation, excuse me, and that includes vimentin, and these are more highly expressed in cancers that are not sensitive to this combination. Similarly, we found that protein expression of e-cadherin uh, in this cell line panel also correlated highly with uh, sensitivity to this combination. So this is one potential biomarker that we're very interested in exploring in our initial clinical trial. And to evaluate the feasibility of this, we evaluated a, a panel of KRAS mutant lung cancer patients and found that, um, that assessment for markers of epithelial differentiation such as e cadherin or mesenchymal differentiation such as vimentin is feasible. And we found that roughly half of patients retained um, uh, ep uh, epithelial differentiation noted by uh, preserved e cadherin expression and absence of vimentin expression in the tumor, whereas another half of tumors had some degree of loss of e cadherin or gain of, of vimentin. And so this, uh, again, is potentially a, a useful biomarker that we will apply to our initial clinical trials. Uh, finally, uh, we also uh, plan to utilize this existing optimized uh, 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 screen infrastructure uh, to identify additional combination strategies for KRAS mutant cancer, since, again, we do not expect all patients uh, to respond to a single combination treatment. And we'll do this in two ways. One, we plan to survey a, more, uh, uh, a larger collection of KRAS mutant cancer cell lines from different tumor types uh, to identify a potential MEK inhibitor-based combinations uh, to give us a more global assessment of the molecular susceptibilities of KRAS mutant cancers. But at the same time, this will give us the opportunity to identify combination strategies that might be uh, effective in a specific tumor type. Also, since uh, some KRAS mutant cancers just may not be sensitive to a MEK inhibitor-based combination, we also uh, will uh, expand this approach to uh, include other inhibitors, which can very easily be run in parallel. Uh, and some of the uh, possible candidates that we might use would be other effector pathways of KRAS, such as PI3 kinase, or inhibitors of other novel RAS targets that have recently been discovered through synthetic lethal screens by other laboratories, such as TBK1, uh, identified by uh, Dave Barbie and Bill Hahn, and uh, TAC1, recently uh, identified by Anurag Singh, Jeff Settleman, and, and, and Daniel Haber. And so I'm going to close there. I want to uh, thank a few people. Uh, first of all, Jeff Engelman, my laboratory mentor. Uh, Jeff Settleman, who was uh, my former laboratory co-mentor prior to his departure to Genentech. Hiro Ebi was the co-first author on the uh, BRAF uh, colorectal cancer EGFR story. Um, and I'm very grateful for his assistance in that project, as well as the other uh, members of the laboratory, and Cyril Bennis and the uh, Center for Molecular Therapeutics at MGH for all of their help. Um, my colleagues in the Center for Melanoma, uh, particularly Keith Flaherty, who was instrumental in uh, 
in uh, launching the initial trial of BRAF uh, and MEK inhibitor combination in, in BRAF mutant colorectal cancers, my pathology colleagues, uh, GI colleagues, and Kwok Wong uh, for his help in, um, in uh, the uh, experiments involving the genetically engineered model of KRAS mutant lung cancer. And finally, um, I want to thank my, uh, my uh, funding sources for their support. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there questions now for, uh, for Ryan? Yes. Hey Ryan, uh, great talk. Uh, two questions. Um, uh, why not focus on ERK if all roads in your models lead to MERC? ERK? I'm a, and potentially with the MERC ERK inhibitor. Right. Um, second, are you concerned about the thrombocytopenia with MEC and 263, and would 199 be a better choice? So those, are, so those are two great questions, Jay. So, so first of all, I think that we, we certainly intend to look at, as I mentioned in, in that last, uh, or the slide just before this, we certainly will look at the effects of other inhibitors. I think our rationale for starting with MEC inhibitors is there's much greater experience with MEC inhibitors in the clinic right now, there's, uh, uh, whereas ERK inhibitors are just entering the clinic. But uh, you know, potentially those could be valuable or per perhaps even more valuable combination partners. I'd expect that their effects would be largely overlapping, but certainly those are, those are experiments that we need to do. And then uh, to address your second question, so one of the, um, one of the uh, most notable side effects of Abbott 263 uh, in, a, in, in clinical, trial, uh, clinical trial therapies where it's used as monotherapy has been thrombocytopenia, and this has been largely attributed to its effects on BCLXL. So uh, we think that, that um, and actually it's actually led to the development of more BCL2 specific inhibitors that are being used in other indications like CLL or potentially small cell lung cancer. We actually think that BCLXL is the major uh, player in, in KRAS mutant cancers and so I think that, that largely that's a toxicity that we may be stuck with although when we've, when we've done some initial uh, work with Abbott uh, to look at this combination uh, in, vi in vivo models, we don't seem to be hitting uh, to having uh, significant problems with the thrombocytopenia as of yet. Um, th the thrombocytopenia also recovers uh, with time. The other uh, thought is that these patients with solid tumors tend to start from a little bit of a, of a higher level than, than, than some of the patients with hematologic disorders that have been more heavily treated, but it's certainly a, a very important consideration. Jack. Oh, Dan. Brian, Okay, there's, a, there's a striking difference in effectiveness between small molecule inhibitors of EGFR and antibodies against EGFR. Right. In your model of BRAF colon cancer, are they both equally effective in suppressing the feedback loop? So, so, so that's a very important and a, a fantastic question, actually. So we, in our model, uh, personally have not tested the antibodies. And that's very important because I think there's at least three different clinical trials that will be launching, and all of them so far that I know of will be using an antibody. I will mention that <coughs> Renee Bernard's group did uh, use the antibody in addition to a small molecule inhibitor in, uh, in, in, in uh, his group study, and the, the activity did seem uh, to, be, to be similar. But, you know, I think that's, that's going to be, uh, that's, that's definitely a potential uh, hiccup that's worth uh, it's worth thinking about. But I think that the, the, the primary driver to using the antibody was, was really a toxicity concern. And yes. I think that the overwhelming thought was that we were going to run into more problems by trying to combine the two small molecule inhibitors uh, yeah. than with the antibody. Just to comment on that, there, there are potentially a lot of pharmacokinetic interactions between the, the small molecules, which are uh, inhibitors of uh, P450 and could change drug levels significantly uh, through that interaction. The other consideration, I guess, is that uh, the monoclonal antibody is the one EGFR class of inhibitors that is approved for colorectal cancer. And I don't think there's been any evidence of activity of the small molecules, although that doesn't mean that they won't work in combination. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point, too. And that's the, that's the other kind of the, a secondary consideration that's pushed most of the companies to move forward with an antibody is the fact that it's there's already some demonstrated efficacy, yeah. but. Uh, yeah. Other questions, yes. Both you and Rooney Byrne have shown very nicely that overexpression or overdrive of EGF receptor overcomes sensitivity to BRF inhibitors. I was just wondering uh, why you wouldn't see more often or why you wouldn't see RAF mutation and RAS mutation together in tumors it seems to me that that would be acting the same direction, right? So that would be for the tumors a way of overcoming. Uh, so so this, the question is, do, why don't we see RAS yeah, and RAF mutations in the same tumor? Yeah. So typically, 
you know, initially before, you know, in treatment naive tumors, you almost never see overlap between RAS and RAF mutations because they tend to activate the same general pathway. <clears throat> it's certainly possible that, that RAS mutations or basically any mechanism that contributes to activation of RAS could be a very important uh, contributor to, to resistance to BRAF inhibitors. Uh, there was uh, some great work done by several groups, including Neil Rosen's group, Richard Murray's group, and a group at Genentech that showed that in the presence of activated RAS, uh, BRAF inhibitors actually induce MAP kinase pathway signaling through CRAF, uh, uh, through RAF heterodimers. And so basically any mechanism that increases the level of RAS activity, be it EGFR activation, potentially a RAS mutation, uh, could be a big problem. In fact, actually NRAS mutations, uh, acquired NRAS mutations in melanoma have been found to be a, a, a mechanism for uh, acquired resistance to RAF uh, inhibitors. I think we have time for one more question. Bill. At least many of the ATP competitive kinase inhibitors seem to be associated with fatigue, malaise, anorexia, nausea, et cetera. So I'm wondering about the challenge of combining multiple, at least small molecule kinase inhibitors moving forward, especially for those that are ATP competitive. And are pharmaceutical companies embracing uh, developing more specific inhibitors? Because at least some of the companies I've interacted with, you know, we're in an era now where sometimes being quote unquote multi targeted is viewed as good, at least when you're using the drug as monotherapy. Uh, do you really think we can uh, affect this sort of change in mentality where we're going to really see very specific agents that maybe will have somewhat more modest activity as single agents, but will be precisely the drugs that will lend themselves to combinations? Yeah, so I, I think those are all very important points. I think well, one thing to mention is that the MEK inhibitors, which we actually use in both uh, in, in, in both in BRF mutant and colorectal cancer, but are they're actually not ATP competitive inhibitors. I'm sure you know they're allosteric inhibitors. So that, but but you know, thinking forward to other potential combinations, that's certainly a problem. And I think that, you know, again, getting back to, to Daniel's questions, that's one, again, one concern we had about moving forward with a small molecule EGFR inhibitor. Um, I'm finding actually that a lot of uh, the companies really are very open to these, um, to these combinations and are more, you know, eager and willing to explore them. I think that really time will tell whether, whether these uh, will work or whether the, the problems that you, that you say will arise. Um, as far as, you know, the, the kind of the less specific or, you know, I think that, you know, if you get it just right, if you get just the right amount of dirty in your inhibitor, it's great, but, but you know, it's hard to, to really know a priori what, what, uh, what that will be. So it's, it's you yeah. know. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan.